welcome to, I think, the last talk of the evening. This is um, the Living Autistically panel. Um, and last year was the first year that we, we actually included this. Um, and I'll, I'll discuss that a bit. It was uh, conceptually a little bit difficult in how to approach the topic that we're interested in, um, given the nature of what we're talking about. And I'll be a little more specific about that. Uh, but we're going to go through uh, a number of different scenarios. The conceptually, the Hollywood connection and such will make sense uh, because we've tried to use that as, as the one thing that could kind of bring these things together as best as we could. Uh, I thought it was actually probably a little uh, bit different than that in, in that Hercules being part of Hollywood uh, or a normal part of Hollywood um, uh, and you think about the trials of Hercules, and I think about our children that uh, go through many more trials, probably on a daily basis. Um, but more interesting, that's his wife, Hebe, who is the goddess um, of adolescence and immortality. And as a, a wedding present, if you will, uh, gave him eternal adolescence. Uh, so not only did he suffer through the trials, but uh, he was also perpetually an adolescent, which... Uh, maybe a good thing, maybe not so much. Um, I work at UCSD and Rady Children's Hospital and also in, uh, a member of uh, Autism Tree. So just getting back to the book club program, this was started in August of 2020 uh, and was essentially uh, a group of typers uh, and books uh, and trying to discuss books uh, at a very sophisticated level. Uh, it became much more than that uh, because we were dealing with typers and people that communicate in a very different fashion. So being online made a great deal of sense uh, when it came to this type of a book club. Uh, this is something that was interesting to me. In <clears throat> May of 2022, UCLA was happy to announce that a man with autism was the first nonverbal graduate uh, of UCLA. Um, when my son was applying to college, UCLA wasn't that interested in people that were on the spectrum. Um, and even if they pretended to be, didn't have the resources to help those kids anyway. Uh, so it's, it's nice that this is happening. My fear is this is more about UCLA than that individual. Uh, but despite that, I think it's a, a move in the right direction. This was last year. So a year ago, um, this was the panel, the inclusion of typers. And... <laughs> basically discussed a book flowers of Algernon and it's just taken up this is pretty things uh, a novel by Janelle Brown this was a group picture um basically this is a book that now has moved on into becoming a tv series uh Otto makes things happen I'm not quite certain how he makes things happen but he just makes things happen so here he's meeting uh with Anthony Dorr uh, Pulitzer Prize winning author, uh, managed to mention the book club and ask him if he could take part in it, uh, which he did about a week ago. Uh, his club Cuckoo Land book uh, was exactly what they were discussing. Uh, he actually pulled out of his pocket a map of the landscape uh, and the setting of what his book was based upon, which was absolutely fascinating. Uh, and his involvement was fascinating, but even the involvement, which you can kind of see on the right side, uh, of the continuous uh, interplay uh, of feedback and such by uh, the typers. And I really enjoy one of Otto's comments, we are changing the world one letter at a time. So what I'm trying to do is combine disparate groups to increase our understanding. So there's not going to be any conclusions made here. It's not that type of thing, uh, but it's a, to express an understanding of what the issues may be, what some potential solutions are, uh, and where the problems are. Uh, so to do so, I wanted to identify the question. In my surgical background, we don't ever identify questions. That's more from my PhD work where uh, you try to identify a question. The question is, uh, and this was a nightmarish question for I think any anybody has a child on the spectrum, uh, is not in the short term, how is this going to impact my, my child, but will they be autonomous? Where will they be in 15 years, 20 years? Um, you just don't know. And it is nightmarish uh, for those of us that uh, have had the opportunity to deal with it. So that, that's really the question. Uh, how do we identify autonomy and, and what about 
these individuals in this work can help us further identify it based upon a really disparate group of people uh, and a disparate curve. There is no normative kid for or normative curve for the spectrum, uh, and it makes it difficult. Uh, a personal joke I have with my son is you have those that are symptomatic and asymptomatic, and we call the asymptomatics the asses. So it's the spectrums versus the asses. Um, but once again, this is to explore the issue, not to answer the question. So there's no doubt that adolescents may be an especially vulnerable period of development in autism, uh, and this can make the transition into adult social roles and adult level of adaptive functioning very difficult. Life's hard enough, uh, but there's something about adolescence in the milieu of a number of things that are occurring that can make this problematic. Some of the earlier studies that led to our, our nightmares were, um, such as a study in 2009, that two thirds uh, of these kids failed to become autonomous as adults. Uh, and that's a large number. What you've noticed in the subsequent literature that this number continues to go down and down and down. Um, obviously from greater public awareness, obviously from earlier intervention and more effective management. So what are the problems? Uh, normative predictors of participation when you're talking about socialization, uh, greater independence in activities of daily living, better socialization skills, and a greater number of services received. Um, the current literature notes increased rates of several clinical problems in adolescents uh, with a significant increase potentially of anxiety and depression. Uh, there are numerous obstacles to our understanding what the best approaches to intervening in this population of patients are uh, given multiple diagnosis uh, and the potential for multiple benefits of treatment and multiple negatives of treatment. Um, the biggest problem is that there's very limited age specific treatment literature available uh, and an overall lack of research in adolescence in general on the spectrum. So the core symptoms of autism tend to abate to some degree in adolescence and young adulthood. Uh, and this is uh, even more no notable given the improvement in communication skills. Obviously that represents a problem for a number of members of this panel. So as you get older, you have your decreasing core symptoms um, that are basically paralleled or, or exceeded by this uh, improvement in communication. So all of these things are positives. It's rare that an individual will show enough gain that they'll actually move off of the curve or out of the spectrum. Um, there's literature discussing what we call bloomers uh, and kids that uh, bloom off of the spectrum. But the fact is, is the characteristics are still hard. The socialization has allowed a lot of these individuals to avoid detection, if you will. But I, I'm not certain that, that anybody truly blooms off of the spectrum and, and if there's even a need for such. Um, social impairment and repetitive behaviors tend to persist into adulthood and not all individuals will show any improvement at all. Uh, cognition tends to be relatively stable over time. A problem that we've always had is the fact that IQ is so closely identified with cognition, which, which I think is a big mistake, especially when we're uh, discussing this population. So briefly, plasticity, we know that there are different periods of improved or enhanced growth, um, neurologically speaking, uh, early childhood and adolescence being two, two areas uh, of note. All of the research really concerns this first uh, area and not so much the second. And all of our interventions are really directed at this first period and not the second. Uh, and it's essentially like gardening. I mean, that's what makes the most sense to me is uh, periods of growth, overgrowth with um, refining uh, of direction um, of growth and pruning, a lot of pruning. Uh, and that uh, essentially is kind of the pros and cons of plasticity, but I think it has an amazing impact. But what's important is uh, I think this growth, uh, uh, this growth point during adolescence. Um, ATPF has over 200 programs that deals with people along the entirety of the age rank, uh, which I think is amazing and, and was kind of an initial purpose 20 years ago 
Um, and uh, I always find that as kind of a, a satisfying anecdote, um, given the lack of understanding of this that that many years ago. So my primary, my day job is dealing with brain tumors. And <clears throat> a lot of people like to talk about a two-hit model of dysfunction. The initial hit is disorders of neuronal migration, glial migration, uh, disorders of cell differentiation, disorders of structural anatomy. So you're, you're set up with this problem. The question is, subsequently throughout a lifetime, will you experience a second hit? In the case of a tumor, will you experience a second hit, uh, which will uh, create a tumor? Uh, over the basically the priming period of development and up through adolescence, um, the second hit in these kids is social demands, pubertal hormones, uh, which are a difficult thing to remove, and neural uh, reorganization. This is also kind of in conjunction with uh, slowing down of the developing central nervous system, uh, but a slow increase in CNS vulnerability. So there, there are many potential issues uh, at about the time of puberty um, that uh, are problematic and can lead to failure uh, or speed bumps. So I talk about successful outcomes, uh, the speed bumps, pubertal maturation, challenge of new developmental tasks, difficulty in developing intimate peer relationships, increased peer rejection, secondary depression and anxiety. Uh, the levels of risk-taking behaviors are different from normative populations, and it's hard to say what that means. Uh, and some uh, uh, problems with uh, communication from the prefrontal uh, cortex allowing for cognitive control. And these are the speed bumps that essentially make it more difficult to reach what we are considering to be successful outcomes, uh, which are limited. Formation of high quality friendships, acquiring autonomy from parents, forming romantic and sexual relationships. And all these require complex reorganization uh, of existing and underlying functional neural networks. But it's a much more complex problem uh, that we really can address at this time. Um, but Briefly, you're gonna to try to do some of that here. So initially I'm gonna talk with Matt Dunford, uh, the first member of our panel. And my first question is, is who is Matt Dunford? Who is Matt Dunford? Uh, he was uh, just a child from San Diego, California, born on November 30th, 1985. Birthday's coming up at the end of the month, so happy early birthday me. Uh, he, uh, he loved a lot of things in life, uh, but first thing he ever loved was pirates. He loved pirates. In particular, he probably watched Peter Pan like five times a day. Uh, I don't wear hats anymore, but there was a period in time where I went around wearing a pirate hat every single day of my life, and I was obsessed with it, and I just could not be seen without a pirate hat anywhere. You weren't the first. Well, the first, yeah. And uh, my favorite toys to play with were Lego pirates. And so Lego pirates were just uh, my jam. Also, the Playmobiles had pirates, but uh, they weren't as cool as the Lego ones. And I loved uh, the Lego stories and just making, you know, my own adventures with Captain Redbeard and the evil Imperials who were trying to tax the pirates. And I mean, come on, just give them the gold. Give them the gold. Just like, let them steal it. It's fun. And I had this encounter one day where my mom bought me a lego pirate set from toys r us and it had a comic in the back of it called captain redbeard and the gold medallion and i was like wait there's these guys actually have their own story that like they follow and so i was like looking through this but i knew they were saying something in these little balloons and i don't know what so i say hey dad what are they uh saying hey mom what are they saying and my parents had to read me this lego pirate story something like 30 times a day and to the point where you know, I think they just had to sit me down and force me to learn how to read in order to read these this uh, this comic book so I could get my uh, my little fix from Lego Pirates. And then in the year 1992, uh, I was walking down uh, the aisle of a Toys R Us with my dad, and all of a sudden I see this, the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen in my entire life. It was uh, what we now know is a hologram cover to an issue of Amazing Spider-Man, which was celebrating his 30th anniversary at the time. And it was 30 issues of Amazing Spider-Man. And I just begged my dad to get that for me. And that was my first introduction in real comics. And so I became obsessed with this guy named Spider-Man. And I became a comic book fanatic since then. And uh, comics are pretty much my 
passion have been for the past 30 years. And I, uh, I've done a lot of things that have led to this passion and I knew that I loved them, but I didn't know that I had wanted to be, you know, involved in them professionally. And it's led me into several roles over the years, such as being, uh, I served as six years as board president of Little Fish Comic Book Studio, the comic education studio here in uh, San Diego. I had also um, served on, uh, I served as uh, the editor-in-chief of Semantic Publishing and Key Leap Comics. I had also moved ahead uh, into uh, an event called San Diego Comic Fest, which was started by the original founders of San Diego Comic-Con to create a more intimate, approachable atmosphere. And they appointed me as chairman of the event in 2017. And uh, we'll be back in uh, 2023 for another event uh, coming soon. And my day job nowadays is I work at Upper Deck Entertainment up in Carlsbad, where I help oversee the Marvel comic trading card line, collaborating with artists to create these characters and bring to life these uh, stories. Because as a child, uh, comics were a lot more expensive for certain issues. It's a time before readily available graphic novel collections. And I hate that word graphic novel. They're comic books, not graphic novels. It's trying to dress it up into something. You don't, you don't always call a movie a motion picture. Don't be afraid of what it is. And don't be afraid of what you are. Uh, but... Um, with these things, just, uh, you know, I learned about comic book characters from the backs of trading cards. And now that I get to do this full circle, like 30 years later, these very same trading cards that I you know, learned all about all these characters from, I now get to play a process of that in my professional life. So that's pretty cool. So what is this? Uh, this right here is one of my old videos from another career path that I did back in the day. Uh, 10 things most people don't know about the BF-109. I used to work at an online publication called World War Wings, where I uh, I wrote basically clickbait about World War II all the time. And I thought, wouldn't it be cool if we started up a YouTube channel and just started doing stupid clickbait there? 10 things most people don't know about the, the BF-109. Is it the uh, BF-109 or the MF-109? Like some people call it the Bayerisch Flugswerk. Some people call it the, the... And so these videos would accumulate millions of views. And I really liked doing them, but ultimately I had creative differences with uh, the directors of the place and uh, I decided to uh, ultimately leave World War Wings and uh, um, I told them if they don't change their direction you'll be out of business in six months but uh, they proved me wrong they're out of business in four months <laughs> so uh, yeah I really had a good time doing that uh, doing the World War Wings videos and articles and I learned I knew nothing about World War II history and now it's at the point where I know everything about World War II history and I mean, I can't even watch World War II history movies anymore because, like, even starting oh, yet, becoming one of the most feared German fighters to encounter in a dogfight. That voice is a ten things most people don't know about the BF-109. Number 10, shaky landings. As dangerous as it was to other fighters in the sky, landing the BF-109 was incredibly dangerous for its pilots. With a very narrow landing gear and a heavy, powerful engine, these fighters were prone to tipping, making coming back to base tricky every time. As a fun fact, the most produced aircraft in history is the Cessna 172, with over 44,000 manufactured from 1956 to today. Yeah, so it's like dumb little clickbait facts over there. And I had a you know fun time doing that. And then, you know, actually one of the first career paths that I actively wanted to do was getting into uh, voiceovers shortly after college. So I brought back some of that and brought in this like BF-109, world fun fact. But ultimately I learned about voice Who? acting is competitive. Who's and, this? Look, and you'll have this? to look behind you, but who's that? I don't know. That's just our <laughs> surprised guy. It's like... <gasps> It's just like your standard YouTube reaction. Oh my God, I didn't know that fact. Because this guy looks like he would totally be in a World War II history. And of course, this is a uh, wonderful moment right there with this, uh, with, uh, that is John Semper, who is the uh, writer and showrunner of my favorite uh, cartoon of all time, the Spider-Man animated series. And uh, I thought I was a Spider-Man fan in 1992, but on November 19th, 1994, with the premiere of Spider-Man, the animated series, that shot my fandom into overdrive. Now, John uh, is sitting here. This is at the 2019 San Diego Comic Fest, where John and I did uh, a program called The Origins of Spider-Verse. Uh, everyone had went out to go see the Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse film, but I saw it at an opening night, and I'm like, that movie was actually pretty good but it wasn't original. 
So I told John, hey, uh, John, I know you don't watch uh, Spider-Man stuff after you did, but you should really see this movie. No, thanks, Matt. I don't really want to see it. No, no, no. You, you need to see it. You need to see it. And he, I finally convinced him. And he just says, they ripped me off. They completely stole my story and try to pass it off of their own. So we did a little panel there that said, um, he said when he was ending the Spider-Man cartoon in 1994, or in 1997 when it was ending, he felt that they had come out with so many toys that never made their way onto the show. And he always felt that kids would feel ripped off if these toys never made an appearance on the show. In particular, he's holding a toy called Web Armor Spider-Man. And it says, now appearing on the Spider-Man animated series. But he never had plans to put that guy on the Spider-Man animated series. He just came out of nowhere as a toy. And he thought, you know, wouldn't it be cool if when we're ending the show, we take all the Spider-Man action figures that we never used and then put them in an episode on the show where Spider-Man has to come together with these other Spider-Man from different universes to save the universe from ultimate annihilation from this sinister device at the hands of the Kingpin. Sound like any movies you saw recently? Yeah, but John did it back in 1997. And that was just a you know, wonderful ordeal there. And uh, this next picture of me that I see right here is at the uh, 2019 San Diego Comic-Con when I was on the art during the Holocaust panel. I have another friend uh, named Max Scheller who uh, is, he goes around town to conventions and people know him infamously as uh, that guy on uh, that guy with a Game Boy camera taking pictures of people with Game Boy cameras. But his mother was a Holocaust survivor named Ruth Sachs. And Max's mother wanted to put together a Holocaust exhibit in her honor called Remember Us the Holocaust. So Ruth. And she you know, Max had heard that I had done stuff in World War II history, and I had parted ways with World War Wings, and they said, could I provide some involvement in here? And I said, yes. And so I sat on this program talking about comic history during World War II and animation history during World War II. In particular, that scene right there is, I think, the probably best World War II comic ever done called Magneto Testament, talking about the X-Men villain Magneto where he got his intolerance for humanity and uh, from the oppression that he faced as a Holocaust survivor. And basically he said, you know, mutants are going to be prosecuted and oppressed because it's happened before, it'll happen again. We need to get regular humans before they get us. And I think that is the most absolutely well done fictional story involving Holocaust or World War II history. There's only one disconnected moment. And in the uh, attack on Poland, the... Uh, the Junker, the Junker, the Junker planes, the uh, the Ju 187s, are flying and bombing vertically. No, they don't bomb like that. They bomb horizontally. They are dive bombers. They go down like this, drop the bomb, and pull out like this. So the bomb continues to go in that direction. That's the only single moment that disconnected me from the story. Do you see how detailed I got in World War II history because of all this? I walked out of Dunkirk. I was like, this is wrong. Two thirds of these soldiers were from India. Why is it all white guys? What and is uh? Matt Dunford's Double Ray Breakfast. Okay, this is a cartoon done by my friend uh, Jimmy Purcell when I was uh, going around promoting the event San Diego Comic Fest, uh, which is another event that I was uh, going to do. And uh, I'm dressed as Festivo, the uh, mascot, uh, who is designed by uh, cartoonist Scott Shaw. And this is just because... Uh, when San Diego Comic Fest is coming up, everyone knows that I will never shut up about Comic Fest. And this particular joke that Ray here is because in 2020, we were celebrating the centennial of Ray Bradbury and Ray Harryhausen, an icon of science fiction and an icon of stop motion film. And so the double Ray here. And uh, in this particular scene, you see uh, me with the uh, you see me at the Remember Us, the Holocaust exhibit at the Chula Vista Heritage Society down in uh, the Chula Vista Library with several of the local Holocaust survivors, and that debuted the opening of the first Holocaust Museum here in San Diego. And this is one of my little fun facts, because, uh, you know, if you're on the spectrum, you're probably into Pokemon. And uh, this was my World War II history thing. Uh, I... I made a cool observation here that no one had really ever noticed in history. I know in history, you tend to beg, borrow, and steal, but I'm a big Pokemon fan. And uh, these older Japanese biplanes, which had initially been painted with a red sun on them, 
uh, they actually had a symbol. They actually painted them white at the bottom, white signifying death. And so in Japanese culture, older age, white death, white is always sig- symbolized by death. And so these biplanes were actually being used as kamikaze strike attacks because, I mean, rather than, you know, shooting bullets at a plane, you could at least cripple a, an entire destroyer just by crashing an aircraft into it instead. So, you know, sacrifice one just to uh you know kill several hundred on a destroyer and of course the pokemon voltorb which is infamous for its self-destruct attack by because it's a living bomb and blows itself up you realize it was taken from the japanese biplane kamikaze strikes and uh this is a moment that i had um it's, it's a very defining moment where i realized uh almost kind of like what i really wanted to do um, this is in August of 2009. This is at the Mysterious Galaxy Bookstore. The man on the left, that is Mike Towery, who is one of the founders of San Diego Comic-Con. He founded San Diego Comic-Con when he was 14 with the idea of, to, thinks, does anyone else out there like comic books? And so he got together this idea with um, the gentleman on the right, whose name is Richard Alf, who ran a magazine store, and that's where they get their comics. And he's, him, Mike and his friend said, you know, would be cool if there were people out there who wanted to do a to who like comics besides us? What if we were to gather some people together? Richard's like, yeah, that's a cool idea. And uh, I uh, I got this idea. What if we were to get a little convention together for comic books? They called it California's Golden State Comic Convention. San Diego's nowhere to be seen in that because ultimately uh, San Diego wasn't a readily known city at the time in 1969. But they gathered this convention and they asked the great uh, comic artist Jack Kirby to be their guest of honor. And then they also recruited Ray Bradbury as their science fiction guest of honor. They gathered this convention together and they founded Comic-Con. And so that was celebrating the 40th anniversary of San Diego Comic-Con back in 2009. And I'm there listening to them because it's my first time foraying into the world of comic history. I wanted to be a comic historian, so I wanted to meet these people and go there. And then in the background, there's this uh, gentleman, the guy in the glasses, a guy named Batten Lash, who taught me everything I, he knew about style. He said, fashion is what is offered to you. Style is what you choose from it. But he was a great guy. And ultimately, uh, Richard Alf has passed away uh, a number of years ago. But they went on to start a smaller event called San Diego Comic Fest. And then... Mike recently retired uh, from Comic Fest and passed me the reins, and I he appointed me as chairman in 2017. I'm like, it's kind of a really intimidating thing to help for me to like help oversee a convention, but he said it really paid off because you brought a great vision to it, and you love doing what you do. And you know, you can't really go to comic cons without dressing up. You can fight it for a while, but eventually you do a costume. And eventually I started doing some costumes and there was this uh, event going around called uh, called Club Cosplay. And um, it's a nightclub where everyone dressed up in costumes and I would always throw together the dorkiest costume the night before. And for me, um, I just, uh, there was this idea by Ivan, the the manager of Club Cosplay, we want to get Weird Al to perform at club cosplay. Matt, do you think you could do a Weird Al costume? And eventually, my Weird Al costume became such a big hit, and it was considered scary accurate, and they would let me perform on stage, and we sold out the House of Blues. They loved it, and it got to the point where even Al himself called it scary accurate when he saw it. Uh, is anyone going to check out that new Weird Al movie that debuts tonight? I think I am. You know, best of luck to Al and, uh, and Daniel Radcliffe. Oh, I think that Matt Dunford could have been a shoe in for the part, but, you know, just saying. And this over here, as we talk about stuff I do in my day job, this is uh, Spider-Man Metal, a ca- uh, card set that came out last month that I was proud to work on. And here I am. I, I kind of just look at it. I finally did it. I finally did it. It came out and it didn't, it didn't really hit me until like I, I held a pack in my hands. I made an actual licensed product with Spider-Man on it. And I even got to put Spider-Man hologram. There's even Spider-Man hologram cards in the end. And, and it's wonderful. And of course I worked on the Spider-Verse, Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse set, which is, you know, finally debuting now with actor autographs and great olive cards. And I really enjoyed working on this stuff. And it's like, this is stuff I get to bring to life now. It's so cool. And I mean, that's just, you know, a little smidgen here and there, as you can tell. So in answer to your question, because you'll notice you'll ask me a question and then I'll go off and on multiple tangents over and over again. Who is Matt Dunford? He's a giant dork. So 
Who is, is it Sayri? Oh yeah, Sayri, the, the Sayri, the beginning. Uh, I worked for a video game company called Critivo and I w- did work uh, doing the localization, storytelling and you know helping to create video games to bring to life. So I don't really know anything about programming, but I could help with uh, the storytelling along the way. And Sayri, the beginning was a really fun, uh, a really fun game. It, it's 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 release has been uh, delayed a little bit over the years because uh, the developers are in Ukraine and so they're going so. But next year it'll it'll come out. And then the Universe Sim is another game we did at Critivo and that was really fun. It's just sort of like uh, the God Simulator game. It's like what Sim City would have evolved into had it kept going in that direction. It kind of went over to the Sims these days and everyone got to the Sims. But you know, building your own world is the the fun thing there. And so I really like it. And that is Adrian Perez. He's a student of uh, who is a student at uh, Little Fish Comic Book Studio. I met him when he was about uh, thirteen or twelve. He's 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 a senior in college now. How how do they grow up so fast? And uh, he's also on the spectrum. He is very much on this. Uh, He's very much into uh, comics and building his own world and building his own stories. And this was a night that actually happened seven years ago to this day when I brought him up to gre- to meet his hero, the great Grant Morrison, the author of comics such as Animal Man and uh, All-Star Superman, one of the most uh, established artists. He came over uh, to the United States in the early 1990s alongside uh, authors like Alan Moore, Neil Gaiman, and just started the British invasion of comics. And... He, he Morrison adores Adrian because he's never seen such he's never seen a fan so young so knowledgeable about these stories and Adrian will just name off everything about the DC universe and going through in his own way and uh yeah we uh we really got some style there at the uh at the late great meltdown comics in Hollywood and that was a, that was a wild night so seven so years ago to the day would you say this is your ultimate job is this have you already reached the pinnacle are you looking forward to doing a lot more I am nowhere near where I want to be yet. I've done a lot, but there's still so much more I want to do. And because what I do is, you know, I'm not afraid to start at the bottom. I'm not afraid to start at, at, in a grunt position. At, at Comic Fest, I was a volunteer, worked my way up to chairman. At, um, you know, World War Wings was a grunt, worked my way up to the, you know, senior marketing coordinator. And I, you know, I... You know, I'm ultimately, you know, I think of myself in a grunt position at at Upper Deck. I would like to keep going further. I would like to keep doing more things. And ultimately, like the comic collector in me, I'm never satisfied. I just want more and more. I want to create. I want to do more. I want to see more. And I never have a dull day. And ultimately, I wish I did have dull days again where I could just sit back and do nothing. And, you know, I don't really make a whole lot of time for reading comics anymore because it got to a point where my own life became more interesting than the stories I was reading. And it's kind of a, it's kind of a bummer because I miss comics. Thank you very much. Yeah. Next, we're going to talk about the miracle project with Elaine Hall. And basically we wanted to start it with seven questions. What was your vision for the miracle project? Uh, well, I have to say something about Matt because I'm so blown away is that the idea of you following your passion and your family really following your lead mm-hmm. so that as a small child, what you are doing now was so encouraged. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, was, it wasn't it was so easy. I mean, I was an anthropology major, so I had the odds stacked against me. And the only job I could get back when I graduated college in 2010 was a, a job working as a chauffeur. And I did that for three years and it sucked. Okay, but but I, I just to, just to say that, no, thank you. But yeah. the whole idea of following um, our, our children's lead and knowing that they know intrinsically what's right for them. Mm-hmm. Um, there's, there's a mystical concept that everyone before they're born, they're missing, they're missing on this planet. Mm-hmm. And when they come into being, they've been found. So I truly believe that we come here with a mission and a purpose and that our children, our job as parents is to learn and listen from them. So it's not a direct answer of how the Miracle Project started, but it you'll see from these guys and from my story how that evolved. Um, I was working in TV and film, uh, music, dance, drama specialist, and on acting coach for TV and film and writer. And I wanted a child of my own. Um, I adopted my son 
And when he came to me, he spun around in circles and stared at his hand and banged things. And being kind of a creative type person, I just did that with him. And when I did, we create, we connected, we bonded. If he would flap, everybody flap with me, it's fun. And I, and I just learned that flapping is what's done in uh, Qigong of getting out energy. And so um, when my son was diagnosed with autism, I mean, I would just flap with him and we'd be birds and we fly and we play. But um, the uh, traditional therapies at the time were making him put them down and then rewarding him with, with M&Ms and uh, it made him tremendously anxious, which then made me tremendously anxious. So I started learning everything I could about, about autism. Uh, Dr. Stanley Greenspan, Dr. Barry Prezant, just learning every, as much as I could. I didn't know about autism tree. Oh my gosh, you guys are amazing. And um, I found my, I created a methodology to teach my creative friends how to follow my son's lead and how to join him. And slowly by following his lead and learning all about all the incredible things that you do here at autism tree, but having it done in a creative way my son merged into our world, still autistic, still non-speaking, and but happy and connected, using multimodality communication, telling stories through movement, beating on drums for sound. And um, people asked me to create a theater program using what I had created for my son for others. And I created what's now known as the Miracle Project. And it's uh, been... Um, uh, uh, the subject of an, an HBO uh, two-time Emmy award-winning documentary, Autism the Musical. Uh, we've we've um, presented at the United Nations and all over the world. And a lot of those kids that had passions, like you know you shared, had passions as young, very small children um, to uh, express themselves were um, are now in TV and film. Now, my son is non-speaking, and this is a creative musical theater program. People didn't think that non-speakers, actually, I'm using the wrong term, multimodality communicators and typers were not able to be part of the creative arts. And I didn't know any better. I'm neurodivergent myself. I'm a creative. So my son, naturally, the way I would reach him is through creativity and he loves the camera. He loves being in front of people. He loves acting and he types to communicate. I fortunately connected with Darlene Hansen and she brought out my son's typing voice. Cut to a number of years later, I wanted to have more typers in the Miracle Project. And most people did not think that typers could be part of this theater program, but I knew they could because of my own son. So when she introduced me to these incredible, you'll meet them and I will not be talking because their words are so profound. When she introduced me to them, I had the opportunity um, of incorporating in, at the Miracle Project, we create, we write original musicals and movies and films. And um, one of my first experiences with Otto is we, we um, did a show called Journey to Namu which is human backwards, that's a whole nother thing, but we needed some music, kind of meditative music, and Otto composed the music, the, the, um, which was just extraordinary. And I said, like, we've got to do more of this. So we wrote a grant to Ability Central to create the first um, music movement creative program like this for typers and multimodality communicators. And these guys came to class with ideas, with um, their artists, their creators. And uh, you'll see some of their work was all created with them. It was created, the concept of our video, the, um, the tone, the sound of the music, the rhythm, the, they wrote the lyrics and we've defied the odds of what, you know, um, Dr. Levy, I thank you so much for the, the presentation about what happens in adolescence. I remember when my son went through adolescence, I thought, you know, someone came to earth and, and stole my child away, you know, and, and because adolescence is hard for everyone. And when you have a son or, or a child on the spectrum, 
It's like putting miracle grow on the hormonal whatever, but the arts were what helped him and saved him just like it does others. So these incredible young people will share with you about participating, writing, creating, um, giving us the entire concept, a wardrobe uh, location was all through their ideas. And we followed their lead to create a music video. Can you tell me about the video just briefly? Sure. Uh, well, one of the things that I've always wanted is the best for our kids. So often our kids are given like, you know, the smallest classrooms and they, you know, if they're going to do a play, then it's in like a little teeny room with no one watching or everyone's making noise or whatever. So we, we wanted to create a music video and with, we've got state-of-the-art equipment. Um, it was a, a full day shoot. Uh, we had call sheets. We had everything that would be done on a professional level production. And we were making transitions. We were, um, had to wait, wait a lot, just like on a regular shoot. We had to wait a lot. All the things that people say we can't do, our, our you know, individuals on the spectrum can't do, wear costumes and, and ties. And uh, anyway, we, we completely created an original video with a full production schedule, full production. And uh, the concept came from these guys, which is most people think that individuals who may not use their mouth and tongue and uh, to, to talk are a preschool level in their intelligence. But once they can type and share their thoughts and feelings, they are rock stars they're like we call it like them in black you know they're 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 higher evolved and elevated than not only people may think but then most individuals so that's the concept and you guys correct me if you want to say it i'm sure you can say <laughs> sure it much will. better so so i'm going to show snippets of the video and and integrate it with some questions to uh, those involved with the video, just to get a sense of uh, what it means to them, what the impact was. Uh, and then we'll move into some of the questions that I wanted answered uh, about autonomy, uh, the contribution of this to autonomy, uh, and we'll just move on from there. So this is Bella and the Green Screen. So Bella, could you tell us about the Miracle Project's uh, class and how it began? My name is Bella. I am currently a high school student working towards my diploma. My goal after high school is to continue on to pursuing higher education. I'd love to study educational policy and continue my advocacy for access and inclusion. I have dyspraxia, a condition that makes everything I do difficult. I hope to change the narrative that autistics cannot access an education. This experience has been life-changing for me because I never considered myself capable of being a creator, nor a visual and performing artist. Perhaps because I never had the opportunity to participate in this art media, much less see someone like myself on screen. Thankfully, Elaine and her Miracle Project opened the door for us. The Miracle Project came into my life at a time when I was experiencing lots of insecurity due to my school situation. The focus for them was my weaknesses. I felt like my abilities were few. My creativity at that time was limited to writing poetry on occasion. On top of my doubting mind, I had another plaguing issue to deal with, my uncooperative body. I questioned whether dyspraxia could weed me out of trying. The process of moving on command was, and still is, challenging, but not impossible. In the video clip you can see what it takes to support my movement. 
motor modeling and encouraging words made a huge difference. The weekly Express Yourself class helped me overcome my fears. I started seeing my abilities, not my deficits. I learned in the process of actively moving and creating that there is lots I can do. So in a nutshell I was weary at first but I have come to realize that I am doing something that really makes me happy and my input and participation is needed. You get knocked down enough that eventually hiding isn't an option anymore. This is what the Express Yourself class has done for me, it has made me love to shine. What do you think other people's initial assumptions were about that? Uh, uh, and what did you disprove, uh, discover, or make known uh, about your capabilities? I proved myself wrong. I made a video. That was something I thought was never a possibility for me. The song and video tell our experience of being presumed incompetent. We had to make our message known so that teachers stop depriving students with complex communication challenges of an education. Elaborate. I am making it known that my challenges don't limit me. Why is artistic expression essential and important for individuals on the spectrum, uh, especially those requiring multimodality communication? Meaningful experiences are motivating and essential to all of us. I had no experience with this type of artistic expression before. Now I can share the value of seeing myself as a creative human being despite my differences. I think multimodality communicators have been ignored, overlooked and not encouraged to seek artistic expression. We are no different than you. We can and do want to participate in all that life has to offer. I believe in my creative abilities and can see a future in songwriting and production. I needed the Express Yourself class to change my trajectory. It really has impacted my self-esteem in a profound way. I am grateful. For all of us, what are your hopes that this video uh, and others like it will do for our community. Having more artistic expression opportunities, that is my hope. Our community is very much making waves for access. I hope to add momentum to our cause. A door was opened but making doors is our expertise. Mod Squad is unstoppable. Believe us. This is William, also in front of the green screen. So William, also tell us about the Miracle Projects uh, class and how it began. My name is William Del Rosario, and I am a 22-year-old Hispanic Filipino male with black hair, brown eyes, and my pronouns are he and him. I have autism, apraxia, am a multimodal communicator, and use AAC. Thank you for making the time to be here today. What were other initial I think assumptions? There is so much more to this. Most people might think this looks like the next viral video with a dancing dad. What they don't see is the perfect example of apraxia and sensory motor differences. 
My brain and body have a hard time working together, especially in new environments. My motor is being coached in a way that helps me get my body organized. Also notice that I am focused on my dad. More than a communication partner, I rely on my support to be my communication and regulation partner in each changing situation. No one is saying that I am unable to do the dancing or movements. Instead, they are saying how can we support you and giving me the time that I need. Big difference when you change your mind to see the possibilities instead of capacities. <laughs> Why is this expression important? I liked being a part of the Express Yourself program because knowing how my body every week was becoming more informed with the ability to act was awesome. The chance to see myself on the big screen says that we are all able to reach for our dreams when we are given the time to become the person we are capable of instead of the one everyone thinks we should be. Thank you, Will. them celebrating uh, finishing the video. So Otto, same questions. Tell us about the uh, class and how it began. Thank you, Dr. Levy, for the introduction and autism tree for the platform. I am Otto Lana. I am 18 years old. I live in sunny Southern California. My pronouns are he and him. I am a Latin male with lightly tanned complexion and a smattering of sun-kissed freckles on my face. I have short brown hair. I wear my hair gelled back. I have blue eyes and a bright, inviting, irresistible smile. I am a high school senior. I am a motivational speaker. I am an advocate. I am the reigning king of inclusion in my kingdom. Nation. I am an entrepreneur and have a thriving e-commerce business. I am an intern at Kindred Communication as well. I want to plug this business real quick. www.okindred.com Without Darlene Hansen, the speech therapist, I would not have this life or this current level of success. She taught me to type. This is paramount. For your listeners and their families to understand. Without letters, without words, I would not have this wonderful life. Like the royalty that I am, I was born this way. I was born neurodiverse. This community, our community, needs outspoken leaders, like me. That is my connection. That is why I picked this clip of the alley. It shows how we are so many layers. It takes a village in front of the camera and behind the camera. Here is some crazy facts for you. One in four people are disabled. That is 25%. And there are less than 1% of disabled people represented in front of or behind the screen. Making a video like this is groundbreaking. We are jackhammers. We cannot wait for people to invite us. We are building our own possibilities. Positive images speak volumes. I want acceptance. We should be well aware technology exists. No one under the age of 30 leaves a voicemail. We all text. 
Let's be real. My mission in this medium is to show all the ways we are integrated into society. It is the A, B, C of A, A, C. A always. B, B. C communicating. Opportunities for communication are everywhere. You do not need a checklist or a data sheet for authentic communication. Be spontaneous. The Express Yourself class at the Miracle Project has given us a platform, and we are running with it. Experiences like this are perfect for forging friendships. The examples of our collaboration to make this video come to life are much richer than the IAP, your turn, my turn friendship goals. We were presumed competent. We were given the creative space to thrive. It began and ended with communication and support. This exemplifies our interdependence. People focus on autonomy and independence. But I want to make interdependence the focus. We are all connected. And that is why I chose the clip of me typing in the alley and having a conversation with the director, Chili Pack. It is shameless product placement. This is Hollywood, baby. I am always repping. How am I going to be financially independent if I am not figuring out ways to sling my merch? I also want to touch on adult relationships too. It starts with friendships, but also a paradigm shift. That was the main point of our video. We are so often infantilized. Think about it. There is no human sexuality course in the special education curriculum. I think it will be up to the mod squad to tackle this topic, too. Elaine, what do you think about the Express Yourself class doing a mashup of Marvin Gaye's song, Let's Get It On, with the A, C. I love the idea, Otto. Only you could get the licensing. So I think we could write our own song. <laughs> I'm on it. Well, Anna's typing. I want to add that. Um, oh, great. That um, also the team here helped raise the funds to, to produce the video. So talk about entrepreneurial.
So these are some additional questions I just wanted to ask, and we'll just hit a couple of them because we're running out of time, or run out of time, which is my fault. Uh, would anybody like to talk about autonomy? I had talked about autonomy before. Um, anybody with any considerations about autonomy? Uh, autonomy is always going to be one of the difficult things because I, you know, have a situation where people always say it's like, oh, you can, you're like everything that you've done is because you have, you know, like, because your parents are well off and they gave you a good life. And I'm like, you so see, you're saying I can't do anything on my own. Well, they're probably right, but no, no. Um, yeah. And it's like, you know, I wish, uh, you know, I could be one of those people that says uh, my parents are jerks and just, uh, you know, look at them in the, you know, in the eye as they, uh, you know, are sit there in the fifth row and whatnot, but I can't. Um, but, you know, I have been, I have had supportive parents. And so the whole thing is, it's kind of hard to leave autonomy when they are, you know, caring of you. But then eventually, you know, there's only so long where you can, you know, be a college graduate sitting on your mom's couch in your underwear before, like your parents say, get a job, get a job. Okay, I guess I got to do this. Thing. But eventually, you uh, want to do, uh, you want to do things on your own. And I think it's like, you know, because you can't really be defined by parents. My dad has always been supportive of uh, my love of Spider-Man and Pokemon and Lego pirates and all that stuff. Not always understanding. So it's like, I got to do my own thing. He's like, hey, dad, can we do that? It's like my dad typically understands he doesn't do anything fictional. In fact, every time I try to get it, there's only one show where my dad has really gotten into, which was the medical drama House, Dr. House, also on the autism spectrum. They did an episode of that. But, yeah, and it was a great thing of that. But the thing is, oh, cool, medical drama. My dad solves the problem in 10 seconds because that's how doctors are every single time. So but that I, I love the, the idea of what you're saying with your parents and Otto had expressed that earlier on too. So thank you. Um, or Otto, what you were talking about, rather than focusing on, on um, autonomy, uh, focusing more on, you, you stated to focus on interdependence. Yeah. Can I share my thoughts on Bella and the clips of William? Yes, I have more to add, to be honest. I expected nothing more than another opportunity to Zoom with friends. I had no idea we could collaborate on this level. And now Elaine has unleashed the beast. The genie is out of the bottle. There is no going back. It was empowering. The miracle project threw rocket fuel on our creative spark. And now we are soaring. I see myself working in many areas of production. I enjoyed the pre-production, creation and planning. I most definitely enjoyed production day. The camera loves me. And of course, post-production, promotion, 
of the work, I have a gift, people want to engage with me. Promoting this film has been exciting. I'm even exploring the finance side of production. William, Bella, and I have applied for a grant to fund our next project. Great art takes fat racks of cash. Does anybody want to move past us and them, ours and theirs? We need to think in terms of we. We need to move away from autism spectrum disorder, A, S, D, versus autism spectrum symptomless, A, S, S. Are you saying those without a diagnosis of autism or autism spectrum disorder and now known as asses? A little comedy for the masses. Huh. But seriously, we need representation as leading roles. And we need access to meaningful careers. We do not need viral videos of the water boy who finally gets to play on the court or on the field. We do not need to star in this type of pity porn. I want to thank everyone for the open hearts and minds. Let's create a beautiful world together. Hopefully, next time you have been upon and a a c user, you will think that person has some greatness to share. Let's have a listen. Thank you. I very much appreciate it. And just saying, you know, we exist. It's it's oftentimes hard for us to reach out. Uh, we appreciate when you reach out to us. It's really nice because, you know, new situations for people on the spectrum are always going to be intimidating, but it's something where we can de develop comfort. Did you know that once upon a time, my greatest fear was public speaking? Yeah, just like 98% of the population. Now I actually really enjoy it. You, the truth is I'm actually more comfortable talking to a crowd than I am to an individual person because there's a you know, wide range of things that an audience can say. Um, but it's not as wide as what an individual person can say. So it is very comfortable. And I thank you so much for this opportunity here. Uh, you know, it's hard for us to break out of, you know, those repetitive things that we do. Little things uh, are always going to be, you know, the whole difficult thing and venturing out, you know, and, you know, we are not very good with eye contact you know, it activate it activates the internal stress set uh, threat sensor in the brain, and basically, oh, this person wants to fight me. This person wants to fight me. So if you see me par wearing a diff hundred different pairs of sunglasses all the time, that's the reason why I've always uh, got my uh, got my eyes covered. And that's just you know a little bit of understanding for us and what we do. And I know that I have it different than others on the spectrum. And you know, my panelists up here with me, I've learned so much from them. And it's, but they've shown that they they're geniuses too. You've heard them talk. You've heard them. You've heard them express themselves. You may not have heard them talk, but you've heard the words that they have expressed through typing, and that there's different ways to get your message across. And as long as you're getting your message out there, I think that's the most beautiful thing. 